Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode 291 of the Spearhead Sundays podcast. I'm your host, Lewis Spears, and uh, I had a good week, man. I had a phenomenal week. I got the amazing opportunity to open for uh, comedian Andrew Santino while he was doing his Melbourne shows here in Australia. It was incredible. I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit later, um, but... Uh, yeah, man, it was uh, it was it was a lot of fun. I got my shows coming up in two weeks. Loosebeers.com. I got twenty three shows in Melbourne. That sounds like a lot, but they are small shows. So grab your tickets, especially if you want to come to a weekend. I just performed to like a thousand of fucking Santino's fans, and they're all buying tickets now because I did really well. So it's uh, you know fucking you guys got to get your tickets now if you want them. It's time to buy them, okay? And uh, yeah, dude, we're about ten Patreon supporters away from four hundred patrons. Uh, I'm, I want I want to get to five hundred by the end of the year. So uh, we're, we're almost to 400, which is really cool. Thank you to everyone who jumped on since last episode. Uh, and yeah, that's that's everything that I've got to plug. Um, what else did I want to talk about here? So we have, uh, I, I, I think that um, I, I think that I'm going to have to move houses. I think I'm going to have to move houses because I think that uh, I may have um, just made a, a, a horrific impression on my neighbors. Uh, as you guys know, I'm a comedian, right? I tell jokes, right? Now, part of my process is I will write a joke and then I will write a funny line and I will amuse myself so much with that line that I will just start saying it and delivering it out loud to myself when I'm in the house alone at, at all times. In Would it be funny if I yelled it? Would it be funny if I said it quietly? Would it be funny if I said it in a weird tone? The point is, I say it over and over again. When I find my funny punchline, I fucking say that shit all the time. Now, this is very out of context, and I will and and let me just say, I'm writing a joke about uh, about people who just don't who don't do things at work, right? And uh, I worked. Uh, I used to work at a, at a at a butcher, and I would clean things. And I had this uh, this line. That uh, is in a joke, and the line is, uh, "I don't give a fuck, bitch. Watch, wash the bowl. I don't give a fuck, bitch. Wash the bowl. I don't give a fuck, bitch. Wash the bowl. I don't give a fuck, bitch. Wash the bowl." Now I was doing this thing, trying to work out how to say it in my joke uh, by myself in the house again and again and again, and uh, I was doing chores while I was saying this, and uh, I, I was emptying out the rubbish, uh, and uh, I grabbed the rubbish. And I walked out my front door and I went, I don't give a fuck, bitch, wash the bowl. Uh, and and there right in front of me across the fence was my neighbor. And it just sounded like I was screaming at jazz <laughs> to, to wash the bowl. And uh, so I'm going to have to move houses. And also, you know, now uh, after just saying that to you guys about 16 times, I'm yelling it directly at the neighbor's house. Uh, and I'm, I don't know how soundproof my house is. I'm thinking not very. So uh, I think that not only do my neighbors must believe that I'm some kind of abusive guy that screams at his girl if she doesn't do the washing, they must also think that uh, that Jazz sucks at washing one particular bowl or, or that she's refusing to wash one bowl and I'm just taking it out on her. So I'm, I'm going to have to move, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that it's worth it because I think it's a funny joke. So loosebeers.com, come see me. Uh, I opened for Andrew Santino uh, in, in Melbourne. I did that last night. Uh, I'm recording this one on a Sunday because I wanted to talk about the show. Uh, that's why it's coming out late on a Sunday. Um, but, uh, man, it was so much fun. I met Andrew in 2019. So I met Andrew Santino through Andrew Schultz. So me and Schultz were, were talking online for ages while... What, kind of what I think, well, when me and him were talking regularly, I think that's when he was like a little bit bigger than I am now, I think is when we were kind of talking. And then, and uh, he had a lot of questions about YouTube and, and podcasting and we were going back and forth. I had a lot of questions about stand up and, and w what the scene is like over there. So we were just kind of like trading knowledge for months online. And then uh, he really, really started to, to take off um, uh, pretty soon after that, which was cool to see. And I helped him get uh, book a show uh, in Australia and I opened for that show. And then when I went over in 2019 to New York, I went and I hung out with him 
uh, when I was there for two weeks, and then I went to LA, and I didn't know anyone. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't even. I didn't even know like Australians that were living over there. I knew absolutely no one. Uh, so I reached out to him and I was like, hey man, I'm going to LA. I don't know anyone. Can you introduce me to like any comedian? They don't even have to be big, just fucking anyone. And then he goes, uh, yeah, do you know Andrew Santino? I'm like, fuck yeah, I do. He's huge. I love Santino. So he's like, cool, I'll hook you guys up. Uh, and then Santino took me out to lunch and I was like, oh man, what a nice guy. That That's so cool. And then he goes, dude, I'm going to the comedy store tonight. Do you want to come? And I was like, fuck the comedy store. It's like, that's the most famous club in the world and has been for like fucking decades and decades and decades. Every comedian's done there. Every single comedian's done there. Uh, so I'm like, fuck yeah, I want to see the comedy store. And uh, I go there and he, he introduced me to to Neil Brennan who co-wrote the Chappelle show. He showed me around. To, I think there were four stages or at least three stages in the fucking comedy uh store and he took me around to all of them he performed and i got to see him and then he took me to like the biggest room where joe rogan was doing his show and fucking took me backstage i met joe rogan i had a great chat with him and I, it was the, the most the most magical inspiring incredible night uh probably of my life where i was like oh my god it was it, i think it was like because it was 2019 i had just released my comedy special and I was really thinking all right for me to take my career to the next level I need to start um really seriously thinking about moving to America and and or, or, or the UK and and my trip to New York and LA was like me picturing if I were to move to America would I like it because I was like I think I need to move there but if I go there and I fucking hate it that's horrible. So I need to go and test the waters. And, and I, I figured out I like New York much better than LA. But for, for me, that trip was like, man, I like, I need to, can I make it, you know? And, and within a month of being in America, I was like hanging out with like one of the, the biggest, like new gen comedian that's, that's come out out of, out of this whole like podcast wave uh, at the time. And then he introduces me to the guy, Joe Rogan. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. This is where I need to be. Um, and then COVID happened and, and that day like really kept me fucking going through COVID where, where nothing was possible and you couldn't do your job and everything was fucking awful. I was like, yeah, but I was there for a month and I fucking did all of these things. It's possible. I just need to get through this and get there. And, and even that day still now, then I'm going through the surgery and I told Santino this last night, I was like, man, that fucking time you took me around and and showed me, basically showed me what's possible, uh, and and what I could one day achieve and see myself without getting like a guided tour from someone who's already in there was like such an important moment for me. Uh, and I told him this, and it's what has kept me what kept me going through COVID of like when this is over, I can fucking pick up where I left off, and and it's what's getting me through these surgeries of like. I'm, I can't do what I want to really be doing now. I can only really do the comedy festival and I can fucking do it well, but I can't really have like a long-term thing until I'm through with this. But when I'm through with this, I know where I'm going. So it's really been like a, like a beacon of light for me. It was like that, that time, which is, which is what Schultz, you know, helped me with, what Santino helped me with. And then basically Santino came to Australia to, to, to shoot a movie. So I text him and I go, anything you need, what do you need? I'll help you out. And I helped him find a podcast studio and told him where the clubs were and all that kind of stuff. It's so funny. Like the difference is uh, uh, American. Whenever, whenever I've spoken to American comedians who've come to Australia, they're like shocked at, at, at uh, how different the scene is here. Uh, and by different, I mean how much uh, worse, <laughs> like how much, how little uh, opportunity there is to, to not just succeed, but perform in general. So Santino's here and he's like, hey man, uh, what are the clubs? And I go, well, here's the thing. You're shooting a movie, right? And because you're so successful in comparison to every comic in this country, your movie is shooting at the only comedy club we have. So you can't do any clubs because you're so successful that you have shut the club down. And he goes, what do you mean? where are the other clubs? And I said, well, that's the funny thing, man. We've got one <laughs> and you've shut it down. So I could, I could, I recommended him like a night at a bar that happens once a week. 
You know, I, I was like, look, man, there'll be there'll be 40 people there. They might be interested in listening to you, maybe. And he's like, cool, man. I reckon I'm just going to play golf instead. And, and I was like, you know what? Good call. But anyway, the, they finished shooting their, their thing at the, um, at the comic centers. They were shooting some, some movie that's coming out. Uh, it's uh, Andrew Santino, uh, Zach Efron, and uh, another guy called Jerome, who I hadn't th- heard of, and John Cena. I like the big names in the film. Um, so they're all kind of shooting this film, and, and part of it was at the, at the lounge. So that was all shut down. But they finished that bit, and then uh, Santino booked a spot uh, at the lounge, and then he gave me the call up to come and open for him, which is amazing. So uh, that's how that happened, and that was really cool. That was like a, that was like a, oh, oh, thank God, fucking, at least COVID didn't rob me of that too, you know? At, le- at least like the fucking connections that, uh, the, and friendships that I started in 2019 are still kind of there after not talking for like four years. I was like, okay, that's cool. Um, that's good. And uh, do the shows. They were fucking amazing. Uh, I, I think I did really well. The first show was a little bit rusty because I hadn't performed for a while. The second show, I fucking smashed it out of the park. Um, and what was really funny was uh, Zac Efron ended up coming to the show. And he comes backstage and, and I met him. And uh, he is so lovely. He is... He, it, it was shocking to me how fucking normal the guy is he's just a dude you know he was he was really nice he wasn't because this guy i didn't realize how famous zach efron is because i i never i was around for high school musical but i kind of forgot about it because i never i never watched it but i but high school musical chain like that's all that my entire school spoke about for about a month singing the songs and doing the dances and talking about how hot Zac Efron is and, and all that kind of shit. And, and I never watched the film, so I never really got it. Um, but uh, I'm only now kind of just realizing, because I looked him up afterwards. I was like, oh yeah, I, I hear his name a lot. He is quite famous. This guy's like, maybe maybe like a step below Justin Bieber famous, like that fucking insanely famous um, and he was like shockingly normal, like such a normal, lovely guy. Um, and he, and he didn't need to be. And also he was, he became so famous, so young that you would think that it would fuck you up at least a little bit. And I don't know, maybe he could be hiding it. He could be, he could have bodies underneath the fucking house, but he was such a lovely dude. Um, and, uh, yeah. So what happened was. I think, man, I don't think you want to be that famous. Is is my takeaway from like meeting him and like talking to him and 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 hanging out with with other people because there are a bunch of actors there from the movie, and um, I don't think you want to be that famous. I think comedian famous is as famous as you want to be. Anything beyond that is like movie star famous, pop star famous. It's too famous. It's too much. You don't want that because. Uh, they were making a big deal. Someone was coming in, like someone was coming backstage and, and I didn't even know, you know, and I'm fucking performing. I, I was kept out of the loop as I should be. Right. Um, and, uh, someone was coming in and I was like, Oh, I, I wonder who it is. And then, uh, Zach comes in with like, with, with a guy who I can only describe as, uh, as professionally dangerous. You know, he was a South African guy, which already you hear a South African accent. They're either like, um, like a, like a warlord, uh, uh, benefiting from genocide or they're like the, the, the most dangerous man you'll ever meet in your fucking life. That's the only type of, of white South Africans that you meet. Uh, or they're like a really, really annoying woman. (laughs) It's three South Africans. It's, it's a, it's a dude that is really good at hiding how racist he is. And he's real racist. There's there's a very very annoying woman, and those two are married. And then there is the most dangerous cunt you will meet in your life, and that's who I met. Right, lovely dude, but you could just tell that he was on alert, ready for anything at any moment. Like that guy would kill me, no hesitation, and he would get away with it. And 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 I think that that not many people would notice and my body wouldn't be found for a couple of hours they'd be out of there that's who i met um but he was lovely right he comes in 
And then Zach's behind him and he walks straight up to me. I'm standing up and he goes, are you security? Because <laughs> I'm like fucking massive and all black. And he goes, are you security? And I go, no, I'm, I'm a comedian. And he went, oh, and like, it was like, oh, well, and then it just immediately starts looking for other security. And you know, Australia is like, I think when I was when I was in, in LA at the comedy store, especially, there's so many famous people go there, like Kevin Hart and and just like cele big celebrities sit in the audience. So there's fucking security guards everywhere, and sometimes celebrities show up with their own security too. So it's a it's a very like well oiled process of like my security talks to the venue security, they work something out and then I go in and I get escorted and sat down and there's guards and everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing. We don't have anyone that famous in Australia. There's no we, there's no need for that sort of like intricate security system. What we have is is like a uh, just big cunts, you know? Like we uh, we got a fucking a few big boys. And uh and and they're not trained in any any form of security they've never met a really famous person in their life but they do play rugby like that's what we've got so in walks like the most dangerous man on earth personal detail for zach efron and he's trying to like organized organized security for the president but instead of having like secret service he's just got like a bunch of boys who who play rugby on sundays and they're and they're like uh in in amateur league and they lose a lot and that's what he has to work with but they managed to work it out and they did this whole fucking, this is what I mean, like this, I think it would be so fucked to be that famous because I don't think that I could, could not, because basically you have to employ someone who's, who's like professionally paranoid for your sake, you know, who is constantly thinking about insane fans, uh, paparazzi swarming you, stalkers, uh, people like who would rob you, like all that kind of shit. You have a guy who's who's whose job, his only job, is to keep you safe from everything, and he's constantly on the lookout for danger. I think that that having someone around me like that would make me paranoid as fuck, and that would and that would make me weird. Zach wasn't weird at all, but but I feel like that would fuck with my head. That would be like that's the type of famous that just would not be fun. You know, and and he goes out in the crowd wearing a face mask and while I'm performing so no one notices and all of that, all of that fucking bullshit just to enjoy a comedy show. But uh, yeah, so that was a real interesting thing about meeting him. And then afterwards, you know, do, do the two shows. He saw the second one and then we uh, come back backstage and he, and he was like, man, you were so funny. I loved your stuff about this and the bit where you did that was so good. And he was like so genuine and and nice and like cool when he just did not have to be at all like i was the fucking australian opening act for a guy he's in a, he's in a movie with and he was just like so nice and and spoke to me and gave me the time of day and i was like man that's really really nice what a lovely dude and then he goes um uh to santino he goes oh we should get a photo uh while we're here right now look I'm not, I'm not some freak. Okay, I met Rogan and I and I did and I did not ask for a photo. I didn't. I didn't even say, check out my this or I've done a video on that. You should have or you should have a look at me or I did nothing. I just had a conversation with the guy and that was it. Because 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 that wasn't the vibe, right? Okay, but in this scenario, a bunch of people were taking photos. All right. A few of the actresses were taking photos with each other on backstage. Uh, everyone was getting in photos. I'm there, and I'm like, okay, well, this is like the photo opportunity. So, so I go, I go in with Santino, right? Great. And then I go, oh, can we get one to Zach? And bro, he he shot me down in the most the most a list polite. And and cool, and and inoffensive way, because there are so many ways he could have said no to me. Right? He doesn't have to take a photo with me, okay? Because, firstly, he could have gone no, sorry man. No, firstly he could have gone no. Secondly, he could have gone sorry man, nah. Thirdly, he, he could have gone. Oh, I'm just kind of taking photos with like people that I know and that I'm in the movie with. Fourthly, he could have gone. Uh, look, bro, maybe, um, 
you know, maybe, maybe like another time or, or maybe later and then just never have done it. He could, those are all great no's, right? He, or he could have gone ab- absolutely not. Or he could, have, he could have avoided the question and had his scary as fuck South African guy go, absolutely not, no, right? All good no's. But he hit me with, with a no that was so fucking cool that I didn't even realize that I had gotten a no until 10 minutes after it was said. This is so smooth. So I go, he's taking photos with everyone. So I'm like, okay, cool. This is like photo time. I'm going to do that. And I go, get one with Andrew, photo. And they go, hey, Zach, can we get a photo? Because we've been talking uh, back and forth. And and he goes, oh, uh, uh, can you not post it like right now? Because I don't want people. And I was like, yeah, dude, I, like, I don't have to post it at all. If you like, it's just like a memory. And he goes, oh, okay. Um, how about this? Uh, we'll get my, uh, my guy to take a photo and then he'll send it to you uh, later. And I was like, yeah, perfect. No worries. And, uh, and we stand up, we take a photo. We take like three photos, the flash, everything, right? And then, and, he, and, then, and then the guy goes, what's your number, man? I put my number into his phone and he goes, cool. I'll send it to you in a bit. And I was like, great. And then 10 to 15 minutes later, I had all the good feelings of like, man, he was such a nice guy and he was so down to earth and he didn't have to give me the time of day and he was like cool and he said nice things about my act. Like what a what a genuinely nice dude. I love Zac Efron as a person now. I'm a fan, right? Uh, and, and, then, and then 15 minutes after that, I was like, they're never going to send me that photo. <laughs> I am never, ever going to see that photo ever in my life. And that is fine. That's so unbelievably fine. I don't care at all. I am, I don't give a fuck about it so much that I've, I've, I've haven't even felt disappointment. I haven't even gone, oh, I am just in awe at how smooth and how practiced and well rehearsed from everyone in the room that was. Because you know he's done that to heaps of cunts, right? Absolutely. And I bet everyone else in the room has seen that trick happen and they all just watched it happen. And they're all watching me taking a photo with Zac Efron going, this dickhead actually thinks that he's going to get a photo that he can post with Zac Efron. Nah. (laughs) And that is so... I'm going to start doing that to people. I'm going to start doing that shit. Just not not because I I, I, I need to, because he has to do that because he needs to. Because why would he trust me? You know, you're going to have a good conversation with a guy, take a photo with him, and then he sends it to paparazzi, and all of a sudden your night's fucked. You know, like I'm sure that's happened to him. Like I wouldn't do that stuff, but also why would he trust that I wouldn't? We don't really know each other. So of course he's going to give me hit me with that no. But and and cuz he needs to cuz that's the way that he has to live his life cuz he is that famous that he can't just be giving photos out to people when he's in locations where he doesn't want to get mobbed, right? Because he has fans and paparazzi and people whose job is it is to follow him and take photos of him looking ugly or looking fucked or or looking good or or whatever he's looking like at the time so they can sell it to magazines and just you know just fucking leech off him like that awful type of fame uh so why would he trust me so he's definitely done this and it was definitely rehearsed and i respect the fuck out of it that was such a such a good cool no i don't think i'll ever forget about it so if you ever meet me and you go hey lewis can we get a photo and I'm with someone else and I go, yeah, no worries. Let my guy take it on his phone. Because that's the thing. It wasn't on my phone. He, he even goes, he even goes, my guy has the newest iPhone. The photo will look better. <laughs> so not only am I left thinking, man, what a cool down to earth guy. I'm also thinking, dude, when I get sent this photo, it's going to look great. Because it's on the fo- the new iPhone with flash and, and oh, dude, they even did I noticed this. They did portrait and landscape. You know? That's incredible. And you know what's even better than that? Obviously, I'm not upset. But if I was the type of person that would get upset about not getting the photo, I wouldn't be angry at Zach because it's not on his phone. It's on his mate's phone. So if I was the type of person to get bitter and angry, right, I would be yelling to you guys about Zach's mate, not Zach. And I'd be going, oh yeah, Zach wanted me to have a photo 
And Zach was such a cool guy, but he's bloody hopeless. Mate didn't fucking send me one. And Zach avoids all blame. Fucking genius. Fucking genius. I'm unbelievably impressed. Having that experience is genuinely better than having the photo. Absolutely. What an incredible no. As you guys know me, I'm all about those good no's. There's nothing impresses me more than a good no that gets you out of a situation. And that that was fucking flawless execution by everyone in the room. 10 out of 10. I don't need the photo because I've got that story. Incredible. And, and now, God forbid, if I ever become that famous, which I hope it never happens, I know how to turn down a weird cunt who's asking for a photo when I don't know him like that. <laughs> So yeah, the, the show, show's a cool man. It was good to link up with Santino. If, you, uh, if you've if you never seen Santino live, highly recommend. His show was really good. He was working on uh, on new stuff. I think it was like his, his, his first month into doing like a new show, I believe, since his Netflix special came out. And fuck, it's good already. So I think by the time he comes around to your city, it's going to be like fucking phenomenal. If what I saw was like it uh, at its like rawest, you know, if that's the worst version of that show, that is is fucking incredible. So it's already at an awesome starting point. It's going to get even better. So uh, yeah, thanks to everyone who's, who, who said hello as well at those shows. They were, they were really fun. And um, yeah, that's that. So what else? Do, oh yeah, also, man, uh, Americans are so funny because uh, it's, it's an American film, obviously, that, that they're filming. Right, so so everyone, there was about fucking 20 to 30 people that involved with the film, like there were actors and actresses and uh, uh, behind the scenes people and directors and PAs and all these kind of people we went out afterwards. And uh, man, it, 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 it felt so American. I felt like I was in LA again, because I kind of was. They imported LA and I was, the, I was the one of two Australians there for the night. And um, dude, Americans are so fucking loud. They are just the loudest, hey? You know, I, I don't. They didn't notice because they never notice. But man, you walk into a bar with a, with with. If one American walks into a bar or a cafe, every Australian looks at each other and goes, "Fucking loud, aren't they?" You walk into a bar with thirty of them. <laughs> <laughs> Can't start putting on earmuffs, you know. Like I start start seeing all the looks that other Australians give me. Like, oh, here we go. Big fucking group of Americans. Great. Now I can't hear anyone. Um, and the Americans are all oblivious. They're all lovely, but it is, it's just such a funny cultural difference of like America, uh, Australians are like so much more quiet and reserved and, and culturally, like how people perceive our cultures, you would think that it's the opposite, but it's not, you know, Australians will say more fuck things and do more outlandish things. But if you dare raise your voice in a public space, you don't fucking be annoying um uh so I, yeah I, I did my bit and uh man i had i had the, the i heard the funniest one of the funniest horny things i've ever heard uh, that i've ever had said to me right and i and I've, I've had a lot of a lot of funny horny things said to me especially since posting the full outline of my mate a couple of days ago uh i'm doing this bit and uh i did this bit about being tall right and uh finished the thing blah 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 go out one of the girls that was at the show she goes uh, hey wow so you you really are six foot eight and i was like yeah i am she goes wow six foot eight hubba hubba <laughs> but she hit me with a hubba hubba and she was serious i was she said it and i started laughing because i because like that's like a that's not a thing that that any that i i thought that anyone said but she was deadpan serious as fuck that's how she communicated that she, that she found me attractive. And that is hilarious. That's made me like reevaluate every single movie and TV series that I've watched that I've considered to have cringe dialogue. Because so often I'll see like a Marvel film or a Disney TV series or like a scary movie and, and some character says something to another character like, golly gee whiz. And I go, I listen to that and I go, no one on earth talks like that, you know? But, but then in real life, I had a woman say, hubba, hubba. <laughs> 
So maybe they do. Maybe I have the fucking unrealistic idea of what people people speak like because you know one minute i'll be i'll be watching a fucking tv s- series of star wars going they fly now they fly now and i go that's cringe and then i hear hubba hubba in real life deadly serious and i go you know what maybe they do speak like that maybe i'm the one thinking weird incredible hubba hubba I'd say I'd say that's one of the that's one of the greatest compliments I've ever received in my life is it is a genuine hubba hubba. I thought I was in a fucking cartoon for that entire interaction. Hubba hubba. <laughs> hubba hubba. That's fucking awesome. Oh man, okay. Who else did I meet? I uh I met the I met the director of the film who was who was lovely, uh, a guy called Peter, and uh, he was such a nice guy and and uh, got along with him well. He said he's like he said a bunch of nice things about my act as well, and I was like oh that's cool, and then and then I uh, did the thing and, and then I left and uh, and I was like I, I realized like oh fuck I probably um I probably should have maybe like googled who the director is because he could have he could have been some like massive big shot guy and he's the he's the dude that fucking directed um a bunch of he's peter Farelli, a guy he directed a bunch of jim carrey films he did dumb and dumber dumb and all the all the dumb and dumber films he did um he did shallow hal he did like i don't know i googled him there was like 15 like really successful genuinely brilliant comedy films from the 90s and onwards uh that fucking shaped me as a as a person when i watched them when i was like fucking 12 you know, to, 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 to 16. Uh, and I was like, Oh fuck that guy. I didn't get to say, dude, I think dumb and dumber, like informed my personality heaps. <laughs> you know, I remember watching shallow Hal on free to air channel 10, watching advertisements for big brother up late with scented titties in the shower in between fucking scenes of, of Hal going, you know what? You know what? Maybe fat bitches are good people too. Maybe women are people. Maybe someone being a disgusting, ugly, fat slob doesn't mean that they're a bad person too. Despite the fact that I would rather rub Vaseline in my fucking eyes and pretend that I have conjunctivitis than even glance at a fat bitch um so he was lovely that was, so that was uh yeah really cool um john cena was there i didn't see him i, I assume he was there because i didn't see him and 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 no one said that he was there uh and and no one talked about him at all but i'm assuming that he was there i just couldn't see him um so yeah that was my uh that was my weekend now, uh, with that with that said, guys, uh, Patreon, patreon.com, every single week, we've got a Patreon-exclusive episode of Spearhead Sundays that comes out, uh, and uh, you get early access to the podcast, unless I record them on a Sunday, like I am today, uh, which is pretty rare these days, um, but uh, yeah, if you want to support the show, I'm not, uh, I'm not touring relentlessly this year, I've got another big surgery coming up, so Patreon is what I'm really, really leaning on, and what I'm really... Um, trying to trying to push because it's kind of the only constant, like definite guaranteed source of money in my life and it's funding fucking everything. We're back to square one, you know? It's not a couple of years ago when I had a few things going, a few balls rolling. It's you and me, baby, again. It's it's it's, it's us, all right? And I'm, I really want to hit 500 patrons and so do the people I have to pay my mortgage to. So guys, I'm 10 people away from uh, 400 patrons. We Let's get that over to 400 uh, this week. It would be fucking amazing thank you to everyone who's been jumping on board and and uh thank you to everyone who's been leaving nice comments uh and, and everything like that and uh yeah i appreciate it um but speaking of um speaking of uh you guys being jumping on board and being so cool i i had a realization the other day um and this is something that i've that i've kind of mused on every now and then with with the show and and with just what i've done uh, with my career so far and and but now i th- now i think i know i really understand something about you guys and and i think and i'm grateful for it it's really good 
I've always wondered like, what type of audience do I have, right? What, to- what, what, what defines my audience? How could I sum them up, right? Because I'm not a guy like Zac Efron, you know, where I'm like a, a sex symbol and, and have been like an integral part of millions of teenage girls' lives. And I'm, I'm not like an A-list guy who, who has so many fans that it, that it uh, impacts the way that he can move physically throughout the world. I'm not that. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not like uh, some fucking intellectual, right, who people love to see debate or, or, or believe everything that, that they hear when they say it. You know, I'm not, I'm not like a Hassan Abi or a fucking Destiny or, a, or an Andrew Tate. You know, I'm not, I'm not that. Uh, the type of audience that I have, I have a, I realized the other day, I have a, here's, here's a story, right? I put out a video, stand-up clip, on Instagram and TikTok. It got taken down on, from TikTok because it violated community guidelines uh, where, where, where because, right, you know, on paper this sounds bad, I, I called a 14-year-old boy retarded and it was revealed that he was in special ed, which, <laughs> <laughs> which hearing that come out of my mouth sounds really bad, doesn't it? <laughs> sounds really bad, but... You had some context in, he was cool with it. I met his parents, all had a great laugh, totally fine. Complimented him afterwards, made a big joke, apologized. Great little like back and forth moment, right? I post that and uh, most people, everyone, 99% of people are like, this is funny, right? Because it was funny. The audience laughed. The person I spoke to laughed. The parents of the person I spoke to laughed. Everyone fucking laughed. One person, right? One one comment, one person goes, uh, this man really just used a slur, right? And then they, I noticed, unfollowed me, right? So they didn't even, they didn't even condemn me. They didn't even say, I'm offended. They didn't even say this wasn't funny. They didn't even say your outfit sucks. They said nothing negative. They just said, this man said a slur, and then unfollowed me, and they didn't even say, I'm unfollowing you for this. So they they didn't even really say anything negative, right? They said something like, what happened? And then unfollowed me. They, they, they spoke with their actions, which I actually respect, right? If you don't like something, don't support it. Don't try and kill it. Just walk away. Love that, okay? So many people responded to that person, uh, with just you're an idiot or the, the, the person was okay with it. Uh, you're offended, but the person that he was speaking about isn't, you're not even from the fucking demographic that can be offended by that word. The person that he was speaking to is from that demographic and he's fine. Just like all of these reasons why they're wrong uh, and why they actually should have enjoyed the clip. And it made me realize that I have a toxically positive audience, <laughs> which is, there's a positive audience, which is, ha, 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 I like this. I'm going to support it. There is a negative audience, which is, I hate this. I'm not going to support it. Uh, then there is a toxically negative audience, which is, I don't like this, and no one else is allowed to like it, right? And then you have toxically positive, which is, I like this, so everyone else has to. (laughs) Or they're fucking bad people and wrong and they should be killed. And that's the type of audience that I have garnered for myself. I don't know how I've done it, but I've managed to get a a few thousand people around me that like me so much that if you don't like me, you suck. (laughs) And you are wrong. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure if that's a good thing. In fact, I'm almost positive that that's bad, but I'll take it. I'm buying a ticket to his show, and if you're not, you should fuck off. That's the audience that I've got. And you know, you know who else has that big time? BTS. It's, that's, that's the K-pop fandom as a whole. Is like, I like this, and if you don't, you're fucking racist, and you should die. Here's a gif. 
That's the only that's the only point of difference between my audience and K-pop stands is you guys aren't really posting gifts of me. And you know what? It's time for that to stop. All right? Because I need I'm I'm going to need to see some gifts. Okay? The next time somebody writes something mean or negative or even neutral, anything that isn't unbelievably positive in one of my comment sections, I want to see gifts of me. Or of Young Jung Ho, or however the fuck you say the cunt's name. I'll accept that. I want to see a, a gif of me or Jung Ho or Jung So or whatever the fuck they're Jung something. Young boy, N- NBA young boy. I, what, who are the, where were the young lean? Young gravy, young someone. <laughs> I want to see gifs. Guys, it's time for a miscellaneous bit at the end. This is the part of the podcast where I answer uh, live advice questions sent in by the listener. If you have a question for me, a story, something you would like me to speak about, uh, anything at all, a thought about the show, send it through to podcast at loosebeers.com. What do we have here? My mom is trying to gaslight me into leaving my girlfriend and her kid. How do I say to my mother that I want her out of my life? Ooh, juicy. Hey, Lewis, big fan all the way from Canada. Can't wait to see a live show. I'm actually going to get down to Canada uh, hopefully next year because it's part of the Commonwealth, which makes immigration really easy uh, from Australia uh, and, and working stuff. So I might even be able to get there next year. No promises, but it could happen. Anyway, my girlfriend, 25, and I, 20, ooh, bit of a cougar situation, have been together for over two years, 23 and 18 barely legal. She has a child who's now two years old, almost three. The child is not mine, but we've all been so close together that she calls and sees me as her dad. Her biological dad is not in the picture, and I was more than happy to take that role. Uh, We've been living together for about a year now, and it made me realize my mom is very toxic towards her. She keeps making derogatory comments at her expense. Because of her toxic behavior, my girlfriend and I want to move into a different town where her parents, into a different town where her parents live, uh, but it's a two, a two hours away from where we currently are. I've lived in this town my whole life, and I'm a little bit scared but excited to move away. Ever since I've told my parents about this next chapter in my life, my dad has been very supportive of us, but my mom, on the other end, has gaslit me into feeling bad that I'm leaving her and abandoning my family for my new closer little family i feel like i need to remove her from my life because of her behavior because i've talked to her about it and it ke- and, and kept and she kept denying any wrongdoing basically i need advice on how to break the news to my mom that i don't want her in my life anymore because of the way she's acting sorry for this long dump but i would appreciate your thoughts on it yeah this is an interesting one especially you know i've i've also uh, looked after a, a child that's like that's not mine. I, I've been a, I've been a foster father um, uh, as well. Well, you're, you're not a foster dad. It's a bit different. But I've I've looked after a kid that's, that's you know not my kid, um, and uh, my parents were not toxic. But it is it it, it is something that um, a lot of people in my life were like, "Why are you doing that? Like you don't have to do that." And and the answer is you don't. And that's kind of what's really special about it. You don't have to help. You know, people who have biological kids they they at the at the very least they should you know like uh they they have to uh whereas when you kind of step in uh and do it voluntarily when you are in a position where it's not exactly a good thing but you know it's not it's not society isn't going to look down on you for walking away whereas if, if you do that with a biological kid they will if you're a deadbeat dad a deadbeat mom people look at you and go wow what are you doing with but if, but if you just walk away and, you know, you were with a single parent and then you walked away from them and the kid, no one really goes, ah, oh, what did you do that for? You fucking... In fact, a lot of people in your life will tell you to do that, um, which is uh, which is kind of sucks because, uh, y- you know, you've decided to do this for a reason despite the difficulties, you know, because you can love more than just the parent. You can also love the kid, right? Um and that is a really, really difficult thing for a lot of people to see because one, they're just statistically speaking, highly unlikely to ever find themselves in a situation where they have to decide whether or not they should 
get involved with someone who has a child. So it's not even an option for a lot of people. Uh, and two, a lot of most people, I think, when presented with that option, will go, fuck, that's too much work. That's someone else's problem. I'm not helping that kid. I'm only interested in adult. I don't, I don't want to help kid. Right. So as someone who has been in, in, in your situation, uh, I understand what you're saying. Uh, my parents were very supportive. My parents were not like against uh, me doing this, but other people in my life uh, did say a lot of things. So I totally get what you mean. Um, I don't know. It, it sounds like your mom is very, very scared of losing you. Uh, and a lot of these things, they come from fear. They come from, oh, if uh, if my kid gets involved with this person and their kid, my kid's going to abandon his life, which is something that can happen because it's, I mean, being real, taking on a kid absolutely affects what you can do with your life. You know, that's why so many young people are not having children at these days because they're prioritizing their career or prioritizing their studies or, or whatever. People are having children later and later and later because the reality is you can't live off one income anymore. There is no stay-at-home mom. There is no stay-at-home dad unless mom or dad is making an obscene amount of money. It's not possible. So both uh, soon-to-be parents need to be work and work and work and work until one of them can stop at least one of them, you, kind of both of them, can work less to make room in their life for a child. And I think that a lot of people see that and they and they go, hello. Pizza. Oh, pizza? Cool. I'm doing a podcast. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, a lot of people will see uh, you bring a child that, that you could very easily just completely walk away from with no one giving a fuck at all other than obviously the kid and the person you were with, a lot of people are like, why the fuck would you take on that responsibility when you don't have to? And it would be so much easier and uh, uh, seemingly better for you and your life to just walk away, to be selfish, to look after you, to, to, to prioritize yourself uh, to the detriment of these people. And uh, I think the question that you ask yourself is, well, do I actually care this much about these people do i really think that they are worth it uh and if the answer is yes then you should stick with them and and obviously a question to ask to yourself is am i being manipulated here because sometimes that does happen you know where, where where single mothers or fathers will like just take whoever they can fucking get latch put their hooks and claws into them and then fucking hold them there so that they can you know try and build this frankenstein of a family that doesn't work but but works better than being alone Right, that does happen, but it do that doesn't sound like that's what's happening in your situation. It sounds like you guys have a good relationship. Um, it just sounds like your your mom is really, really scared of losing you. Um, and to be honest, man, that that's that's an I, I feel like I mean you haven't given me too much information to go off here, so I am kind of assuming a bit. I feel like if this kid and this girl wasn't in your life and you were with someone else, or if you got a big job offer, or if you had to move states to study something, or if you wanted to travel for two years, it sounds like your mom would probably be doing this anyway. Because it, it, it sounds like to me that it's not necessarily about the kid or the girl, it's more about losing you, which is obviously a very, very difficult thing for any parent to see is their child move out, any parent for their child to move away. I mean, it was so hard for, for, for my mom. Like, like Jazz and I moved out and it was super short notice where it was just before COVID hit. We found like, we were just kind of tossing up the idea of moving out. This is when I still had the warehouse. So I was kind of paying rent for a workspace anyway. So we were like, oh, it's only a little bit more to rent a house, uh, especially if Jazz chips in. So we, could, we, we kind of worked out that we could afford it and then we were just like kind of looking at houses and then the perfect one just popped up. So we just, we got it. And even we were surprised like, fuck, we were thinking about it. Now we're doing it. And then we told mom and it was a big shock for her. And, 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 and it was really hard for her. She didn't try and stop us from doing it, but it was really difficult for mom and for dad to kind of see me move out. And that's normal. Um, and, you know, the, the, the healthy way to do it is to be sad about it, but to accept and understand that this is what happens and this is what should happen when you have children. They should 
go out into the world and succeed you know, independently of you. And that does not mean that you'll never see them again. It just means that, you, that, you know, they're not going to be like your little baby forever. Um, and that's the healthy view. The unhealthy view is, is being so scared of losing your child that anything that would take them away, whether it be a partner, their child, a job, uh, a dream, a desire to travel, friends, anything becomes the enemy. And that's where she'll start going, well, she's bad for you and it's not your kid and, and why are you worrying about this? It's not your problem and, and, and you know, you, you're, you should have children of your own or you, you're too young to be a father and, you know, you, you can't afford to look after this kid. She's taking advantage of you. That's where all of those, like, fear-based things can come from that I'm assuming are untrue um, because you, you doesn't sound like it is at all. It sounds like you guys have a good relationship. So I, I think that maybe it's not about cutting your mother out completely. Maybe it's more so about setting boundaries because it, it doesn't, it sounds like you guys are having a real big trouble. It doesn't, unless I'm, unless there's some shit that you've, you've left out, uh, unless she's being abusive, which it doesn't sound like she is. It sounds like you're having like a lot of trouble with her accepting that you're gonna leave the nest. I wouldn't cut her out completely. I would just set up a boundary because that's a really important thing to set up with with people because if you don't have boundaries, people walk all over you and that goes for everyone in your life. I've learned this. Um, and uh, I think what you need to do is, you, you, I think you should move. I think you should move and I think you should say, look, mom, I'm doing this and uh, I love you, but if you can't support me in doing things that I feel like I need to do, that I want to do, uh, and if you can't support the people that I love, that I have decided to let into my life, then we can't have a good relationship. And you should say that to her. And if she freaks out, then you should go, it's not my responsibility to make you feel okay with this. That's something that you need to feel okay with. And if you can't feel okay with it, we can't have a relationship. And you can put that boundary up and you can check in in a month. You know, you don't have to cut her out permanently unless she has like, you know, years and years and years of doing this. You know, if you come back after a month and she's still like that, just cool. Well, I'm checking in. I love you. But if you can't accept my life and what I'm doing and what I, what I am and see that I'm happy, then we can't have a good relationship. And as long as you are actually happy and, and you are not getting manipulated because Sometimes mums are right as well. Like that's another thing. Like it doesn't sound like she is right, but sometimes mums are, they know a lot of things that you don't. So take stock and, and have a look. And if you genuinely think that she is wrong and she is just being like gaslighting you and being manipulative and, and trying to control your life, then yeah, just put the boundary up and check in every now and then. Sounds like your dad supports it as well. That's good. He'll talk some sense into her. Talk to him as well. You know, don't, don't put a boundary up with him. Be like, look, I talk to dad because he supports me and understands my life and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and and also, here's a good one as well. Here's a good one that I've used on people. Uh, not not my parents, but but people that are really important in my life that have that have done that to me is is I've gone, you need to let me make the mistake. If you if you truly think that this is wrong, I I truly think that you're wrong. And this is my life. So I understand that it might be difficult, but if you're right, I'll come back. And, I, and I'll, I'll tell you that you are right. So what you need to do now is because I just don't agree with you at all. So you need to let me make this mistake. If it is such a mistake in your head, you need to let me make it. And, and, and instead of learning from what you've told me, I'll learn from experience and I'll be okay after that. And, and, and I haven't ever really had any type of comeback from that. That's the one thing that when I've said I've said that very I've very very rarely ever had to say it, but when I have, it's made people go, "Oh, okay," because again, you know, they they're so convinced that they're right. Then just give them that. Be like, "Okay, cool. Well, you, it's it's essentially agree to disagree, right? Where you're like, yeah, cool. Well, we we can't negotiate this. There is no middle ground here. So I'm gonna go and do it anyway." And if it hurts me, like you are saying that it will, I'll come back. 
and you'll be right and I'll be sorry. But if I'm right, you'll be sorry and I'll be right and, and it'll all be love again. Um, and if she can't accept that, then, then yeah, you need to, you need to put like a, a solid boundary up because it, it, to me, from my brief understanding of what you've written in the email, it seems like it's less about the girl and the kid and all that kind of stuff. It seems more to me to be a fear of losing you in general. And she needs to understand that if these people, if you never met these people, you'd be moving out of the small town at some point, probably, you know? So I would just try to explain to her like, yeah, look, mum, this is my life. And uh, if you really, really think that this is wrong, then let me find out and I'll, and I'll come back and I'll, I'll move in and we'll have a cry together. But if I'm right, I'm right. And just put that boundary up and, and, and yeah, just, you don't have to be a cunt. You don't have to cut her out of your life forever unless this is a repeated thing that keeps happening after these boundaries are set. Then you think about it, but it, it doesn't sound like it's at that point yet. Um, and and you'll see that that you put that boundary up, you move, your dad will do a lot of the work for you. Of like, ah, I've talked to him. He's doing really well. He seems happy and she's good for him and all that kind of stuff. Your dad will do a lot of that work. Because she'll go, oh, he's not talking to me. And he'll go, well, he's talking to me. And, and he's told me that he's not talking to you because of these reasons. I, I, would say, I would say it's very important to not permanently damage your relationship with your mom. Um, because I think that's just a bad thing to do in general. Unless you really, really, really have to. Uh, it's, it's probably a bad thing to, 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 especially at such a young age, to go, fuck you, mom. I'm never talking to you again. Just put, put a good respectful boundary up don't talk to her for ages come back in check in and go hey it's going great you know i hope you can see that let's let's start again because i want to have a good relationship and you know so yeah that's my advice i hope that's helpful um come see me live loosebeers.com melbourne i got to I got a bunch of shows they are starting in two weeks it's time to get your tickets loosebeers.com opening night is in two weeks then i got a bunch of shows you want a friday or a saturday get them now loosebeers.com get your tickets goodbye have a shit one bye